next on AM 1480 WLEA, the Newsmaker Show. Here's Ryan O'Neill. Now, on Saturday nights on WLEA, we have a show called Ring of Fire. It's a left-leaning show, but this uh, past Saturday, they had a very interesting segment. Sam Cedar on Ring of Fire, the usual host, talks with uh, one of the other hosts, Mike Pompantonio, about the opioid problem in the U.S., how it began, and some very interesting uh, behind-the-scenes information about the whole opioid crisis uh, comes out of this show. I think it's well worth listening to. Again, it's uh, Sam Cedar and Mike Papantonio from Ring of Fire from last week. Ring of Fire Radio, I'm Sam Cedar. In the late 1990s, pharmaceutical companies reassured the medical community that patients would not become addicted to opioid pain relievers, and healthcare providers began to prescribe them at greater rates. The result led to over 47,000 deaths. Joining me to discuss how this crisis was the inspiration for his latest legal thriller and which attorney generals are having an impact on solving the problem, Ring of Fire Radio co-founder and attorney, Mike Papatonio. So, Pap, let's just start where um, we have uh, the most, I think, and and you tell me because uh, you have a much better sense of this, We have the most aggressive addressing of the opioid problem, um, at least in terms of holding people to account in Massachusetts. Is that right? Yeah, I think Maura Healy is such a courageous attorney general. Here's some good news, though. You now have uh, an attorney general in Nevada. Uh, His name is Aaron Ford. Uh, You know, (laughs) he is no nonsense. He doesn't have he doesn't he's not all about let's compromise this. His his position seems to be, you know what, you dumped this stuff on us. You knew what you were doing. We're having to pay for it. You need to pay us back. But both him and Mara Healy take the attitude. I call it externalizing cost. And if what I mean by that, Sam, if I were to describe to you a situation where a corporation came into your backyard and they dumped gazillion gallons of toxins into your river and drinking water. And what they did is they did that so they could so they could make more profit. They could take all those costs, ship them over to taxpayers to clean up, externalize all the health risks to taxpayers, externalize all the infrastructure problems to taxpayers to clean up, and then go home and keep all the profits. That's what the drug industry has done here. That's what the opioid manufacturers and distributors have done. They've shipped this all into the uh, into for taxpayers to take care of. And Maura Healy is very angry about it. Aaron Ford in Nevada. You're going to see this. I mean, <laughs> we're going to be handling that case out. Matter of fact, uh, I'll be trying that case uh, with Robert Eglett out there, who's a superb trial lawyer. But it'll be Troy Rafferty, myself, and, and Eglett that are doing that, along with a great team of trial lawyers. And I think it's very possible it could be the first case to actually start trial in America. But uh, so, yeah, Mara Healy is a great American hero. I, I got to tell you, I just, I just really, uh, really... I'm so proud to see an attorney general step up. Sam, do you remember, you know, in the book, I wrote a book. It's called it's called Law and Addiction. Right. And in that book, I talk about uh, it's it's a fiction, but I use real facts all through the book. One real fact was where you had attorney generals about eight or nine years ago that all got together and settled the entire opium. uh, It it is opium. That's why I call it the entire uh, opiate program across America, 150 people a day dying. They knew that. And they settled, these attorney generals settled for $19 million. And then they declared victory, Sam. They got up the next day and said, we've really done a great job for American consumers. We've solved the opioid, uh, the opioid crisis. Then they ran for governor. So most attorney generals, that's why they call it the AG. It's almost governor. And so you've got that happening all over the country. You've got attorney generals, you know, just all over the country that are saying, you know, we just don't, you know, we don't have the courage. We don't have the, I don't know what it is. How do you not take on these folks in, on behalf of your consumers? But Maura Healy, she is. Aaron Ford, he is. 
and you're going to see some real these people are these people are going to run into some brick walls where it comes to trying to soft pedal this with these attorney generals because it's deplorable what happened. They right. helped they helped create the opioid crisis by not doing their job all the way back then. On this morning's Newsmakers show, it's the Ring of Fire show from last week. Ring of Fire is a uh, Democrat show that we run on Saturday nights. On today's show, they're talking about the opioid crisis. This is uh, Mike Papantonio and Sam Cedar on Ring of Fire. All right. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about the context of uh, of that crisis. And of course, in in, in law and addiction, uh, you start with. A, uh, a law student who loses his brother to uh, an opioid overdose and uh, coming from West Virginia, which in many respects was, you know, ground zero uh, for this, uh, or at the very least was one of the greatest illustrations of the problem. But I read that th in 20, I think it's 2017, we had the highest number of of overdose that we've had from this. And that's the thing that I think people don't understand. And I think your point about the attorney generals signing off for a couple million dollars, several million dollars, as if the problem was over. This is a problem that the ripples of, I mean, even, you know, w w even though uh, to some extent we have corrected the, um, the overprescribing that was happening, the implications of this ripple, and that's the interesting thing about the, the policy um, answers we're seeing and about uh, these court cases that you're involved in, it seems to me that in terms of like the remedies, because you have people who are dying years out mm -hmm. from the initial sort of, I guess, act, which mm, was yeah. the malignant act. Like, just explain that dynamic well, to us and then how this implicates what kind of damages or what kind of policies one would seek to redress this issue? Okay, well, first of all, let me, let me spend another minute on that. You understand the attorney general in West Virginia, one of the states that were hit the hardest, settled with one of the worst players for $25 million and then come to find out, oh, by the way, his wife had worked for the industry. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's time and time with this ugly story where we've seen political officials like this attorney general in West Virginia who just are nothing but an arm of the industry. I mean, they, they don't they're not really they're not real. He's not really an attorney general. I mean, he's got the he he has that title of attorney general. He's not really an attorney general. I mean, he's working for the industry. So that was happening all over the country for many, many years because they were pumping so much money into these various races and making all kinds of promises. So, OK, where that left us was the solution is that a city or a county uh, for let's take Nevada, for example, because, again, that's where I'll be going to trial in Nevada. You had a situation where the EMTs, the cost for just EMTs in about just one county there went up like the entire infrastructure cost to just to address the problem in one year was three hundred million dollars. OK, so who is going to pay for that? D does the taxpayer in Clark County pay for that? I mean, they got to pay for that. Or do the people who took all the money home, shouldn't they pay for that? But we're so upside down in the way we look at this in law and addiction in that book. Again, it's a fiction, but it's all based on what I'm doing every single day. I took the depositions in that case, not all of them, but I took a lot of them. I heard the stories firsthand from the distributors and the manufacturers, and I saw it firsthand. I, I handled the distributors. I didn't handle the manufacturers because I think the manufacturers are only one part of the story. But the distributors are the people who were right there, I mean, right doing business every day in the cities all across America. They're the people that would see people lined up around these pill mills. They had salespeople right in the town. And that salesperson would drive by these pill mills and see people at 8 o'clock in the morning standing outside in their pajamas waiting to get their drugs for the day. The salespeople saw that. This was no surprise to them. They saw exactly what was happening. So, um, so the solution, the only solution, is you've got to make them pay back the taxpayers. That's the that's the first step. And then the second step is they've got to pay for years and years of rehab. Here's the problem, Sam. This is a very different kind of addiction. It's just like it's just it's the equivalent of heroin addiction. 
the dopamine levels in the brain change so dramatically. The receptors in the brain are so affected by opium. And that's all this is. It's opium. I mean, let's call it, we want to call it Oxycontin and opiates. It's opium. It's the same opium that almost decimated the entire continent of China, you know, just uh, thousands of years, a couple thousand years ago. So what, in, what ends up happening is in the United States, we now have to rehab people that their that their brain on the dopamine on the the significant changes of dopamine in the brain are so dramatic that it takes three years for those dopamine levels to even return to normal wow. to where you can even rehabilitate them. All right, well, Pap, let me let, let's take a break here. When we come back, I want to I just want to go through this because it you know the dynamic that you're talking is is basically where you started with this notion of a system that privatized the profits socialized the costs, laid them off not just onto the customers, uh, theoretically the patients really, and society at large, and those people who are tasked to protect the taxpayer and society at large basically were asleep at the wheel, short of a couple of um, uh, attorney generals around the country. This morning on the Newsmaker Show, we're replaying a Ring of Fire show and a couple of segments from the Ring of Fire show about the opioid crisis in America. Uh, a lot of interesting information in this show. And it's uh, Sam Cedar, the regular host, talking with uh, Mike Papantonio, who's also a co-host on Ring of Fire. Papantonio has written a very interesting book about that that you might want to check out. It's called Law and Addiction. Google search uh, Law and Addiction book, and it'll take you to a link on uh, Amazon.com, and you can order that book. We'll be back in just a moment here on the Newsmaker. Hi, this is Mike Davidson of Davidson's Furniture, and our Memorial Day sale means store-wide savings on all our brand names, like Lazy Boy, Broyhill, and Serta. Plus, qualified buyers can have 18 months interest-free financing on any purchase. We have recliners from $299 and Lazy Boy reclining sofas from $899. Serta mattresses in choice of size, firmness, and comfort are all on sale. Don't miss out on Davidson Furniture's Memorial Day sale. We're open Memorial Day Monday from 10 to 4. It's meteorologist Rob Carroll in time. Rob, uh, you're saying uh, we're going to have some rain today. I am, Brian. Same storm or part of the same storm that produced severe weather yesterday in parts of Texas, also across Missouri and Oklahoma. It's heading our way in weakened form. Already seeing some rain this morning out towards Mansfield, uh, Ohio, the Columbus area, and that rain is going to overspread our area later today. So if you want to get out when it's dry now through about 10, 30, 11 o'clock would be the time to do so. After that, it looks like there will be some uh, showers arriving across the southern tier and maybe even a thunderstorm as well, temperature 70 to 75. If we do get a couple of thunderstorms today, there's the potential for some locally heavy downpours. Sun came up this morning at 537. It's going to set tonight at 839. Tomorrow, Brian, looks much better for us. The transition period is tonight. The showers and thunderstorms end during the evening. We turn partly cloudy overnight. We're 50 to 55. With the sun out tomorrow, we should be comfortable, about 70 to 75. Tomorrow night, clear to partly cloudy, 50 to 55. Saturday, we're partly sunny, but we're probably going to see a shower or two in the afternoon. Another front of boundary headed our way, 70 to 75. Sunshine will return Sunday, but it's going to be cooler. More of a serious topic on uh, today's Newsmaker Show. It's uh, Sam Cedar and Mike Pepitonio. We're replaying a segment, uh, a couple of segments from the Ring of Fire show, which is heard Saturday nights. And again, uh, I can't uh, praise uh, Mike Papantonio's book enough, Law and Addiction. Law and Addiction. You Google search that, you can find out uh, a lot of the information and more uh, that you're uh, hearing on uh, this segment from Ring of Fire. Now back to uh, Sam Cedar and Mike Papantonio. I'm Sam Cedar. Right now I'm talking with America's lawyer, Mike Papantonio, about his new legal thriller inspired by the real-life opioid crisis, Law and Addiction. So, Pap, in the uh, last segment, you were uh, giving us a little bit of background. Of course, um, you know, you are involved in cases dealing with the distributors of so-called Oxycontin. You say it's essentially opium. And, and that's ultimately what we came to understand, that the whole premise of this stuff was that it was some type of new, non-addictive version of uh, opium. And it turned out to be an addictive version of opium, like all opium. Uh, and, you, you know, you write about this in Law and Addiction, uh, but they, uh, they thought, we have a new way of packaging this. They ended up convincing doctors 
Some instances, they didn't need much convincing. Some, in, in many, they were just assuming that they were getting the straight information uh, that these things could be prescribed to people who, instead of you know it being originally for people who have survived cancer or going through something uh, acutely painful in a short period of time, they, they started to prescribe it for chronic pain. And there are you know three elements to this. There's the producer of the drugs uh, who told their story. There are the, the patient-facing uh, distributors. That would be the doctors who were relying on material they get. And then there's the distributors. And uh, this is what your case is centered around, the responsibility to the distributors. And my understanding is part of this responsibility is not just a general ethical responsibility to society, but they have a statutory obligation to uh, record when they see Bumps. Yeah. Or okay, let me talk. Of, let me. That's the heart okay. of the, You hit the heart of the case. Look, in exchange for these distributors being able to do their job, the government says there's some things you must do. OK, one thing you must do is you have a responsibility to where if you see somebody ordering levels that are well beyond what they should be for that locality, you need to report them. OK, almost nobody reported like they were supposed to. They, they broke the law in that regard. They didn't report. That's the only thing they had to do. And then the second thing was, once you see it and you report it, you have a duty to try to make it right. You can't just sit there and say, oh, gee whiz, this little town, great example, Kermit. How about this? Kermit, West Virginia, population 400 people. They were selling 6 million pills in Kermit, West Virginia every single year. In my book, Law and Addiction, I talk about how that occurred. What did that? Why did that happen in Kermit, West Virginia? 400 people cannot use 6 million narcotics, right? So that becomes part of the distribution plan, what we call the glut. The glut starts, uh, it, 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 you've heard of the Oxy Express, I think, probably. And the Oxy Express starts in Miami, goes all up the eastern seaboard, and then it started turning out west to Nevada and California. And that, that could only operate... You understand it could only operate if there were enough narcotics out there. If there was enough opium narcotic out there, that's the only way it could operate. These companies understood that they were putting well more than enough to keep the Oxy Express alive and keep all of this diversion, this criminal activity with the drugs, keeping that moving. So to say, well, gee, let, let, let me make a couple assumptions here, Sam. Let's say the first year that they came out with these with these narcotic opiums. Let's say that the first year that they, they didn't know what, how bad it was going to be. So let's give them the first year. Second year, maybe, well, we just didn't know it was going to be this, you know, abused. The third year, we didn't know it was going to turn into criminal activity. By the third year, they absolutely knew. They knew exactly what was happening with the drugs. The DEA told them it was a problem. The uh, General Accounting Office does a great report talking about how they, uh, how the FDA had to tell some of the folks that were distributing this that you're not telling the truth. You're not telling the truth about this being non-addictive. They were actually making that up telling doctors it's not addictive. And the worst part of it, the way they were doing it was by phoning up literature. They would go to a university and they would write a report. They would write a piece of literature, ask some scientist who's only making 150000 a year. In his mind, that's not enough. So they pay him another two hundred. He signs his name to it to give it credibility. They go then tell doctors, hey, look, we have this, lit we got this literature right here. It says that this stuff won't be addictive. So then they start teaching that in medical school. And this whole myth goes on and on and on. This, this, this didn't happen by mistake, Sam. This happened by design. And there's, you can't pinpoint any one thing or one event that took place. It was a culmination of all of this effort by the, by the pharma industry that was selling narcotic opium. They all, you know, if you take a look at the conduct, it all converges. It, it all right. just fits together. Well. I mean, Pap, isn't is it isn't it the case uh, that a couple of years ago the distributors were actually looking to change the law uh, and try and get it to be retroactive because the 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 statutes required the distributor to um, to set a baseline hmm. and to be uh, you know to to um, 
to, to have the data that sets a baseline so they can measure that a spike. I mean, to a lay person, it sounds completely obvious that 400 people should not be getting 600, 6 million of course. Uh, opioid pills. I mean, you don't need to have reams of data and some type if, of like uh, algorithmic, but no, you don't. they well, wanted to change the law. Yeah. What you're, so ta- they, what you're talking I mean, about is Arcos data. Okay. We, our, our firm put together the, what they call the Arcos data. It's, it's centrally reporting what's going on. They didn't even need Arcos data. All they needed to see was pill mills being set up, neighborhoods being decimated. Neighborhoods in this book, Law and Addiction, that we're talking about that I just released a couple of weeks ago. I talk about towns being referred to as zombie land. I didn't just mm-hmm. make that up. There are towns in this country, West Virginia, all, all over this country, that they refer to as zombie lands that were little cities that had mom and pop businesses. They, they, were, they were economically viable. They were sustainable. They, they were prosperous. And all of a sudden, these, these pharmaceutical companies dump opiate narcotics in their backyard. And the, what ends up happening, the next thing you know, the, the, you got bars on the windows. You have people leaving the town. The entire tax base has disappeared because these opiate pushers made, took advantage of that city and made it into something that the people refer to as zombie land. Wow. Now, that's how ugly this is. Well, um, folks can, can, can learn more about um, how we begin in some way to mitigate the damage and deal with all the costs that are going to be, that have been laid off on society uh, for really, I mean, we're talking decades here. Uh, folks can, can both read your book, Law and Addiction, uh, which is available wherever books are sold and, uh, and get a sense of it. And uh, frankly, you know, uh, follow these cases. Uh, watch what uh, Maura Healy is doing up in um, uh, in Massachusetts, watch what the AG in uh, Nevada is doing. Uh, Mike Papantonio, always a pleasure. Thanks so much for your insight. Thank you, Sam. Mike Papantonio is the author of the new legal thriller, Law and Addiction. You can pick it up at Amazon, at Barnes & Noble, IndieBound, or wherever fine books are sold. When we come back, Heather Digby Parton will join us to analyze more news from the past week. That's just ahead. I'm Sam Cedar. You're listening to Ring of Fire Radio. Don't forget, check out ROFpodcast.com to support the show. Hey, folks. It's finally out. Mike Papantonio's Law and Addiction. Papantonio pulls back the curtain on America's deadly opioid epidemic in this spellbinding thriller about greed, corruption, and the power of personal conviction. You got to check this out, folks. There's so much behind this opioid epidemic that will never make the papers, will never come out after court battles, after failure of the U.S. government in many respects to hold these people to account. Sometimes fiction ends up being the best way to tell what amounts to an amalgamation of true stories. So check it out. The book Law and Addiction by one of the foremost tort attorneys, plaintiff attorneys in the country. He's a bulldog, Mike Papantonio, and he's been in the trenches and he is letting you in on the inside story. Check it out at MikePapantonio.com. Sam Cedar there along with uh, Mike Pepantonio from Ring and Fire talking about the opioid problem, or as Mike Pepantonio calls it, the opium problem. Again, I want to recommend that book, uh, Law and Addiction. Google search Law and Addiction, and it'll take you to the Amazon link for Mike Pepantonio's book on this uh, very serious topic. It's AM 1480, WLEA Hornell. 